Welcome back guys, really glad to have you back. Thank you so much for your support this far. Uh, if you haven't liked, subscribed and commented on any of my videos, you better go do some of that up here. Otherwise, right now we're looking at part two of my uh, CBDC video. Uh, this is basically covering central bank, digital currencies, foundational principles and core features by the Bank of International Settlements. And let's get into it. So on page 10 of this report, three foundational principles will be adhered to. This is do no harm, coexistence and innovation and efficiency. In the do no harm, it needs to support policy and objective. What I mean objective is, you know, when you have your governments and your countries, they need to follow those objectives where it's going to, okay? Coexistence, mainly meaning that central banks should continue to provide and support cash as long as there is public demand, right? Can't just, as I said, flick the switch and then everybody's like, oh, what do we do? I can't do this. It's, we have a whole system, you know, businesses and everything it would go crashing the markets would tumble it would be chaotic that would be the most reckless way of going about things and then when it comes to innovation and efficiency you know basics speed reliability and safety protecting the you know you can't get hacked and you can't lose your money the core features now are basically broken into three categories and then within those categories we'll have subcategories so the three categories are the instrument features the system features and the institutional features. So instrument, system, institutional. On the instrument, it must be convertible, convenient, accepted and available and low cost. On the system itself, itself it must be secure, instant, resilient, available 24 seven, 365 throughput. So basically seeing that it's tough enough to sustain the load of people that will be using it. Uh, scalable, interoperable, flexible and adaptable. On the institutional aspect, it needs to be robust and its legal framework and standards need to be set. So that means that rules from what we have currently now need to somewhat either apply or be adjusted in such a way that it kind of can make that transition and we can embrace and bring this into the current system. Okay. With the features covered now, uh, you can look at more things like the design and the technology behind it. Design choices, this has presented possible designs, okay, for the instrument, the ledger, and incentives. So we've got, you know, the core design choices that you'll have, which is what kind of instrument it's gonna look like, which goes back up to those categories prior uh, with a ledger. So if you don't know too much about cr cryptocurrencies, things run off a ledger, uh, and usually it's a decentralized one on the cryptocurrency side, or centralized depending on what cryptocurrency you're looking at. And obviously you have things like, if you look at Ethereum, gas fees and things like that, which are also an incentive aspect, okay? So I'm just comparing. So you, if you have a real world example and you know a little bit about this stuff, it's kind of replicating those aspects and giving it, you know, terminology and real models within what they're trying to do. The instrument must be interest bearing, okay? And improve a cap limit on individual holdings. I interpret that basically as um, to avoid monopolizing the system. So if there's a cap limit, you know, it, it's going to have, you know, decision makers behind it deciding as to how much liquidity will be inside those systems or also as to who has control over it um, based on creating any market manipulation too. So th there obviously needs to be those parameters set in, in stone with putting this forward, all right? So it goes on to say uh, it is too complex and the calibration challenges for the central bank and users. So right now they're coming out very clearly. It's it's too complex for them to, you know, have too much control over this as well. So from what I said previously, that's where maybe a decentralized and decentralized might work uh, in tandem. But I'm going to also go into that in a few minutes because it, it actually goes into that. Anyway. Uh, so the ledger will need key factors to be achieved, structure, payment authorization, functionality, access, and governance, okay? This could be centralized, as I mentioned, or decentralized on digital ledger technology, DLT, or even a combination, and is rarely even mentioned, just so you know, Com combining centralized and decentralized, there's like this huge separatism within the cryptocurrency markets where, oh, 
I would never invest in that coin. It's it's centralized. <clears throat> oh no, this one's the best because it's decentralized. Anyway, I'm not here to, to get into that little squabble. If you believe in a project and you see that there's actually people behind it that are going to give it some you know added value, obviously, unless it is a security, which cryptocurrencies technically are not. But you know, if you put it into play like an ICO, an IPO, uh, the meaning of you going into an investment like that is actually kind of under the Howie standards within the US if you're looking into things like the SEC versus Ripple. Anyway, I'm going way too far again. <sighs> back, 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 back. Okay, an example would be funds in CBDC Ledger. So that's the centralized one. Uh, and security ID, KYC, payment authentications, is a decentralized one. Kind of like Google Authenticator, but that's technically like centralized because it's Google connected to your Gmail account, etc., etc. So it's centralized. But at the same time, would that mean that it's decentralized from, you know, the companies that you're trying to register or log into? If you don't know what a Google Authenticator is, it's something like to increase your security and making sure that you are who you say you are, all right? That's about that, da, 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 KYC. In my opinion, this would be much more welcomed on a company or institutional side of things. It would make it easier uh, because you might not be aware or you are, there are so many obstacles when it comes to doing business. There are you know, loopholes you have to jump over, barriers, you have KYC, you have all these different things that come into to effect when you're trying to do business, especially even more so I think with maybe financial institutions. Uh, so this could actually speed up and diminish uh, drastically the amount of resources in personnel that would have to be trying to, you know, chase all this stuff. And it's, I'm not saying that, oh, it's going to cut jobs. No, I'm saying that, come on, let's be honest. Who really wants to be looking through people's paperwork and making sure that they are who they are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Come on. I think, I think we were born and brought up into this world to do more valuable things, even if it could be watching Netflix and what, whatever the new shows are. Um, but still now, if, if this kind of thing goes all the way down to an individual, I think we can all make our judgment on to that. You know, some people might embrace it and think, yeah, sure, I have no problem with that. Or maybe you have it set up in set such a way that you have one kind of account that has all of that and you use it when you feel like it, but you still maintain your setup as it is today. There's nothing saying that you have to use that because obviously that you'll have probably a lot of ease within transparency and traceability as to what you're doing. So I think that's where there is a balance and it needs to be adopted and embraced by the individual person himself. Um, so, cause this is, this is where the debate comes down to is, uh, oh, I don't want to be giving this information. You know, I'm so private. I'm so special. Good. You know, you could be a multimillionaire or billionaire. If you don't want to get involved with this, you don't have to, nobody's putting a knife against your, your throat. But at the same time, for me personally, if that, this system, I'm registered in so many different things personally, and I think that everybody is nowadays, you can't not be a consumer in this day and age and not be registered providing your information. And if you're doing financial transactions, you give your passport, you give your proof of residence, a proof of identity, uh, sometimes a back bank statement that has to be three months relative. I, come on. You're giving this information out. How about we have something that's way more efficient and easy? Anyway, for all this to be created, there is obviously going to be a cost implication, right? So into effect, that has to have some kind of incentive behind it. There needs to be a design where this is sustainable in its own way. So obviously maybe there'll be um, transaction fees, but if you're looking at the scale as to how big this is, but also the efficiency that comes behind it, it could be obviously much more easier to, to have this kind of system, which is modern, efficient and transparent versus the current one, which is encumbersome and not really that efficient. So running costs, if it is going to be cheap and cheap enough and easier uh, than having all these different middlemen in the current situation, this will cut huge costs. Okay. We need to be clear that, you know, a company that has all this work that goes into doing things and you can have a seamless flow where it's just easier to do stuff, the costs will 
be worth it will be worth it you know people are buying software to make their companies more efficient and they're paying in the hundreds of thousands what if you have a system like this and it's costing you i don't know a thousand you can weigh out the the pros and cons very quickly including the fact that you usually have a person or people behind those software systems trying to manage it and deal with it it's again encumbersome anyway going into page 14 guys so here the last part of this report oh yay <laughs> So last part of this report is uh, technical aspects um, that are kind of under consideration. So remember speculation here, but the further we're going to be going into the channel and the videos that I'll be presenting to you, hopefully it will expand and open up um, more concrete situations as to where things are going or have been. So we saw in the previous episode, if you didn't see that, click here, uh, the, there was the core, core features that were involved. Three core features and then under that, the subcategories, okay? And now it is going more in the technology that is in five sections, okay? So the technology, they've broken it down into five sections. So the five categories that are broken down on the technical side are convenient, secure and resilient, fast and scalable, interoperability, flexible and adaptable, all right? Now, within the convenience side, things like the tech that we use today, NFC, QR codes, you know, something that is like usable every single day, all right? Now, remember, you can also take QR codes online or within your systems, and then you can also have your codes that you can copy, paste and send as well. So the transactions can be uh, traceable as well. Uh, secure and resilient, so cryptography, 24-7, 365, and digital ledger technology. Um, fast and scalable, so this means that transactions have to be in seconds and it must be able to sustain high volume. You know, remember this could be nations running on these systems, okay? Interoperability, so uh, basically everyone's speaking the same language, right? So ISO 20022, APIs, inter-account users online and offline. So it needs to somewhat be able to be stored if there is an outage and then when things come out, back on, it can still work. And I think the offline also inter-account usage online and offline could possibly mean, you know, maybe we'll have banknotes with the QR codes as to what that, you know, NFT represents for a cryptocurrency. But anyway, uh, so even when you're like sending on your banking apps between your accounts or between friends, that kind of system where it can uh, accommodate that use and utility as well, or transacting when you go to a coffee shop. I don't go to coffee shops because I don't believe in spending that amount on coffee. I'm not cheap, I just, I prefer my coffee from home with the French press. Anyway. Flexibility and adaptability. So it needs to basically bring flexibility, old systems to new systems. We have to have that transition uh, and it needs to accommodate that. Otherwise, how are we gonna be able to adopt it at all? To wrap it up and make a bit of a conclusion of uh, the past video, the past two videos, more work is being done for these systems to basically see what kind of trade-offs might come into play, okay? But before anything, more needs to be found for them to see what goals can be achieved or not. So it is clear that there's going to be compromises that will have to be made for CBDCs to be put into play and for them to be fully adopted. Uh, ranging from the technical all the way to say privacy and more that I've pretty much covered in, in this uh, review. Now from my previous video that you might have seen, if you didn't, click here. Uh, in this report, obviously they literally say it they say, this report is in support of the G20 roadmap on cross-border payments, more precisely, building block 19. So area E, building block 19. I mentioned it in my first video. Again, click here uh, if you didn't see the first video of this one. The Bank of International Settlements will be taking steps towards reaching out to central banks, developing countries and economies, and also international organizations. This will also be to continue to help enhancing everything that's in regards to the financial world. Anyway, guys, I hope you've enjoyed these last two videos and I hope the CBDCs are a little bit clearer for you. And until the next one, peace.